I'm telling you what, we got uh, two baptisms today. We have two baptisms scheduled for next week. And uh, next week we'll be celebrating. That'll put, next week will put us at 53 baptisms for the year. Is that not crazy? Amen. 53 baptisms for the year. So we're, uh, we'll celebrate that next week. Our, our hitting our, our baptism goals for the year. Uh, but I'm excited about what the future holds for our church, guys. God is good, and he's doing something so special for us. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, there's a story I heard the other day of the chicken and the pig. And uh, they were walking down the street, and they passed the grocery store. And there was a sign on the store that said, eggs and bacon, desperately needed. Pig looked at the chicken. Chicken looked at the pig. Chicken said, you know what, let's help the grocer out. I'll give him some eggs, you give him some bacon. <laughs> now, the pig said, are you crazy? Chicken says, bye. What's your problem? See what I did there? I sound like a chicken. <laughs> I said, what's your problem? Pig said, for you it's a contribution, for me it's the whole thing. Here's the thing, most of us don't mind giving God an egg here, an egg there, here an egg, there an egg, <laughs> everywhere an egg, egg. <laughs> oh my Jesus had a farm. Matthew, Luke, Mark, Luke, John. <laughs> That's right. We don't mind uh, giving God a few eggs here and there. Because you can lay an egg and walk away. But God wants the pork chops. That's right. And God wants the ham. Right. And God wants the delicious smell. <laughs> Bam. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and here's the thing. I, 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 I think we're like the pig. If I give God the bacon, there will be nothing left. Every weekend is a battle between good and evil in our lives. Saturday night partying and Sunday morning acting like nothing happened in church. This week alone, we're going to celebrate witchcraft and ghosts and ghouls on Monday. But on Tuesday, it is what church? Your birthday. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. It's also All Saints Day. That is not a coincidence. All right? So I know at least one church in America that should be celebrating All Saints Day because it is my birthday. And I feel like if, if y'all just keep hearing this enough, it's All Saints Day and it's my birthday. If you hear that enough, I feel like eventually you guys will forget all my faults and see me as a, as a saint. I don't know if it'll work or not. Um, <laughs> I didn't hear that. Uh, <laughs> but listen, when I look at a pig, my, <laughs> my first thought that always comes to mind, and I apologize to pig owners, okay? So y'all, I can just see it now. I don't go to that church anymore because he doesn't like dogs or pigs. Listen, I, I hear my heart, okay? I hear my heart, okay? I saw a movie once that said, a hungry pigs will eat anything. A hungry pig will eat anything. So always be weary of a pig farmer or whatever you call it. Why? Because they can get rid of bodies, bones and all, <laughs> with a hungry herd of pigs. You see, God doesn't look at the pig the way that I look at the pig. He doesn't look at the pig with disgust. He doesn't see the, the mud that's taped on his tail. It probably isn't mud, okay? That's probably not mud. God doesn't see those things. What God sees when he looks at that pig is the same thing that Dr. Francis Bacon saw in 1561. In 1561, this genius Dr. Francis looked at the pig and he saw bacon. He saw that there was more to the pig than meets the eye. Now, I'm thankful for the grace of God in my life because without his grace, without God's mercy, all he would see in me is a wretched sinner, not worthy enough to even mention his holy name. But because he loves me unconditionally, because he formed me and made me and cares for me, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross, to be separated from him, to take on the sins of this world, to conquer the grave, so that on judgment day, God doesn't see my filthy mess and my failures. When he looks at me, he sees the blood of Christ all over me. That's amazing. And the Bible says we have an advocate in Jesus who's going to look at us and say, look, he's mine. He's good to go. He is mine. I know. You see, it's by grace that we are saved by faith. It was by God's grace. But here's the scariest thing in the world. Imagine for 
for a moment that, that you didn't uh, have God's grace. Now, now this is really shouldn't even be that hard to imagine because most of us live without ever acknowledging God's grace in our life. If we truly understood his grace, we would live differently and act differently and be different. You see, we walk around so entitled as if God owes us something. When, when instead we should be walking around in humble adoration because of his grace alone. We don't serve the God of second chances. Y'all realize this? We don't serve the God of second chances. We serve the God of a million chances. God has not just given Abraham a second chance. He gives me a chance after a chance after a chance, and I keep messing up, but because of his grace, he still forgives. I've had a busy couple of weeks. I was preaching all these places the last couple of weeks. I, I had a funeral on Wednesday and another one this afternoon. There's a, there's a lot going on with the family. We have a lot going on at church. I have all this schoolwork, and all right in the middle of this week, one of my professors drops an exam. I don't know what it is about me. When I see an exam, the word exam scares me half to death. Okay? I get nervous. And, I, and, and then they have these things that they, they call uh, a timer. Okay? You have a time limit. So instead of me worrying about the question itself, you wonder what I'm worried about? The timer. I'm watching the timer going, I don't know if I can do the timer. Well, here's the thing. Probably just not focused on the timer and actually focus on the question. It might have been over past, but I flunked that test. Here's the thing. Half my class did too. Thank God I'm a bunch of idiots. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and so the professor, the professor, he says in his class, he goes, look, because so many of you guys flunked the exam this week, I want to give you grace and let you take it again. And I told my wife, I said, I've been in school half my life. Never have I seen a teacher or a professor do something like that. And I said, I will run through a brick wall for that professor now because he showed me a little bit of grace. That's right, y'all got it. A little bit of grace. Now, if we truly understood the grace that God has given us and still gives us to this day, our lives would look radically different. Somebody jumps in front of a, a bullet for you. You're not going to sit there and go, hey, thanks for doing that. Now, can you get me a, a cup of coffee? <laughs> can you go do something, you know what I'm saying? Appreciate you doing that, but, oh, I need some. No, no, you know what we do? We go, whoa, you just saved my life. You're my hero. When, when Billy Bob comes into the room, you say, hey, this is Billy Bob. He's jumping from a bullet for me. You see what I'm saying? You don't just, you, this guy's your hero. You bend over backwards for him. Well, here's the thing. Jesus Christ saved our life. He went to the cross. He took the bullet that we should have taken, and all he's asking you to do is submit your life to him. And so with all that being said, I want to look at the book of Titus today, Titus chapter 2. Normally I'd make you stand for the reading of God's word, but today I'm just going to have you continue to be seated, all right? Because I'm going to read this whole chapter, and I know if I were to make you stand, some of the older people in the church would, would uh, say words that you shouldn't say in church. And so in order to keep you above reproach and blameless today, I'm going to let you sit for a while, okay? Uh, so remain seated for the reading of God's holy word. Titus chapter 2, it says this. I'm actually going to read the first verse. I'm going to mess them up. But as for you, proclaim the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious, malicious gossips nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so they may encourage young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers uh, at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Verse 6, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of God's uh, good deeds with purity and doctrine dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Urge slaves to be su subject to their own masters and everything, to be pleasing, not argumentative, not stealing, but showing all good faith, so that they will adore the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, appearing for the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify for himself a people for his own possessions, eager for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. No one is to disregard you may God bless the reading of his holy word. You cannot learn to be a Christian until you understand the grace of God. 
Because without the grace of God, Christianity would not exist. Our hope and our peace and our, our assurance without the grace of God would be a foreign concept. Be like trying to put one of those IKEA dressers together while reading the German instructions. It's hard enough in English. You know what I'm saying? It's impossible. In German. You know? But here's my point. Have you ever gone through this life and said, you know what, God, I need a break. God, I, I, I can't go through all this suffering. I'm tired of all this suffering in my life that's going on. God, why aren't you answering my prayers? Have you ever thought that? Listen, Paul went through the same thing in his ministry. Paul, I've told you before, Paul had a thorn in his side. He believed that God removed it. Not once, not twice, three times. God removed this, this thorn in my side. God said, I'm not going to do it because my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. God was telling Paul, his grace was enough. He didn't need anything else. The debt had been paid, right? The victory had been won. And we are forgiven, saved, and redeemed all because of God's grace. All because of His grace. That is enough. But yet we walk around as if God still owes us more. And so as I look at this passage, there are some common themes we see here. The first one is the example. Are we an example of God's grace? Are we living like an example of God's grace? We have cancer survivors in this building. We have abuse survivors in this building. We have drug abuse survivors in this building. We have people that have fallen short of the glory of God over and over and over again, but you keep standing up and following Him. If you've been married for over 30 years, is there anybody been married for over 30 years? Listen, whoa, that's a lot of people. I don't know what, what it is about it, but that in, in itself is a miracle. I feel like, I feel like Jeff, Jeff Probst should be showing up, you know what I'm saying? Giving some of y'all a hidden immunity idol because that is impressive. 30 years, you're a survivor. 30 years. <laughs> That's me, baby. I, I love you. <laughs> Starting to sweat up here. <laughs> if you walked in here today, broken, if you showed up here not feeling worthy enough, if you showed up here because somebody drove you, guess what? These are all examples of God's grace. It's grace. The fact that we're here is a direct result of God's grace. So this passage, we see something I think is important. We see the fact that since we have been shown grace, we need to be an example of that grace. You were actually the older man. He said, be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in perseverance, as opposed to what? As opposed to what? As opposed to what we see out of our men today. I read this, and this doesn't even sound like a lot of guys I know. Today's men are weak, especially in our day of social media, because all these tough guys, they, they hide behind that keyboard talking trash without consequences. We have, we have men today who hide behind the disguise of work, and they always got to be working, and they're always tired, too tired to take care of their family, too tired to take care of the community, too tired to go and take care of the church. We have too many men who are giving up on their families, on their responsibilities, on their role in this society. We need men who can persevere. We need men who will stand up for their families. We need men who will lead their families in the church. We need men who will invest their time and energy in the next generation. Our Wednesday nights, we've got 50 kids that are showing up every Wednesday night. You want to know who all is over at that, in that fellowship hall? Women. There's 20 women over there. Where's the men that are going to sit there and be a presence to the next generation? Who, who's going to be the father? Most of those kids don't have a father figure in their life. I think the men of this church will step up and go over there and be a father figure to some of these kids. To show what a man looks like in our society. It, it, this is the craziest thing. We need men to understand what self-control is. Whether that's with food, alcohol, anger, desires. This is not just a suggestion that tells us. This is a command. You can't do any of these things, though, on your own. You have, to, you have to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You need to repent of how you've been living. Start making a commitment that you're going to start living in the way that you're called to live. And I know you ladies are shaking your head going, you tell him, Abram. <laughs> but he doesn't just stop with the guys. You can see this. Because he, he, he talked, and listen, I told Mark, I said, Mark, you better ramp up security today because I'm going to make a lot of women upset. All right? So if you, this is not me saying these things. This is coming right from, right from God's word, okay? So take it up with God anytime you want. You can take it up with God. It says this, guys. Ladies, you're supposed to be reverent. 
You're supposed to not have malicious gossip. <laughs> that means gossiping to the pastor too. You understand that? I ain't gonna have time for it. Not enslaved to much wine. Not malicious in your gossip. I'll say it again. Not enslaved to much wine. Preach, yeah, I'll say it. Come on. Instead, listen, ladies. It says you should teach what is good. So that you may encourage the young women. Oh, did y'all hear that? You're to encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers, kind, being subject to your own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Are we showing our younger girls what a godly woman looks like? You see, our young girls are in a world of hurt in our society because they're being told that in order to be loved, you have to have a body that's impossible, a job that can support a deadbeat guy, that you need to be able to party in order to have attention, that they need to sleep with a million guys before they turn 21, you have to be able to shake your booty on TikTok. And what's happening is most of them are, are raising children by themselves, alone, frustrated, mad, confused, and disgusting themselves. And I blame the women of the church and Beyonce. Right? Beyonce's always singing about Bex with the good hair and all those single ladies. You know what I'm saying? But she ain't leaving Jay-Z. This is what y'all don't get. I'm independent because Beyonce said I could be independent. Beyonce's with Jay-Z. You know what I'm saying? But she wants you to think being independent, shook around half naked, sitting on top of people. I know the lyrics of these songs, guys. I'm hip. I'm a hip guy. I know what the lyrics say. Okay? I'm not out of touch. But she wants you to think there's worth in all those things. And, and listen, girls, there's not. Our girls need better role models than Beyonce. They need better role models than somebody who is in a, an abusive relationship with a man. They need better role models than somebody who can't stay off of Facebook long enough to get give their kids their undivided attention for 10 minutes. Listen to me, church. I am counting on the older generation to lead our church. I'm counting on them to help disciple our church, to mentor our church. This is the biggest difference between our church and other churches. Most churches try to be young and hip and cool. Your pastor is already those things. Okay? I don't have to try. We, don't, we got that one taken care of. You understand this? But as grumpy and as old-fashioned as some of you guys are, you all hear what I said? As grumpy and as old-fashioned as you guys are, I believe the older generation can teach us young people way more than we give you credit for. Before you start trying to teach the next generation, though, you better make sure your life is right with God. That you are reverent and have self-control in your life because this younger generation can smell fake from a mile away. They can smell it. I'm telling you guys, write these verses down somewhere because this is the example we should be setting due to the God's grace in our life. The second thing we need to look at is, is, is the call. The call that we're given to show grace. God calls us to show grace to others because he has shown grace to us. We're called to love others because he has loved us. 1 John 4, 19 says we love because he first loved us. That is our calling. That's our calling. You want to know why I love this church? Because this church is filled with people who will probably never get recognized. They'll never get their name on a plaque. They'll, they'll, they'll get their face on They'll never. I, well, I'll even say that. You will get your face on a billboard because I don't know if y'all been on 27, but we have a billboard up there. Some of y'all faces are on there. Amen. Anybody seen that? Amen. Very nice. Looks beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Right there. I, every time I drive, I wave. I go, that's my church. That's my church. So y'all wave, wave at the billboard when y'all pass it on 27. Uh, but here's my point. Y'all, so y'all made on a billboard. But most of you, okay, won't make it in the outlook or, or, or uh, you know, I don't even know. We won't get in a book or whatever the case is. But yet on Friday afternoon, they, they, we had tons of people setting up chairs. And tables, sweeping, smiling. They were present. They were asking the same thing. Everybody that was, was, at, was at the fairgrounds on Friday kept asking me the same thing. I don't know if y'all planned this or what, but everyone kept asking me the same thing. You need anything? You need anything? You need anything? You need anything? And I almost sound like, I almost did one of those old dad jokes. A million dollars. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but, but here's my point, guys. On Saturday, our church was serving and loving on people in this community. I've been to a lot of churches. I've been to a lot of church events. 
There, there is no other church like our church. The heart of our church is, is unlike anything I've ever seen. And yes, I've said this before, but we're like fudge, sweet with a few nuts. Okay, there's too many people in this place. But, I don't know about you, but fudge doesn't taste very good without the nuts. Okay, so we need you here too. Amen? Uh, there are way too many people who walk around going, you know what, God has called me to do this. And God has called me to do that. And the calling, if you pay attention, usually always has something to do with being in front of people, being the center of attention. Nobody ever seems to be called by God to make the coffee in the morning. Nobody ever seems to be called by God to be a greeter at the door. Nobody ever seems to be uh, called by God to be good stewards with money. The call always has to be something to do with wanting to be the center of the attention, wanting to have the microphone, wanting to be in front of other people. And we have to be very careful about this because mo more churches are destroyed by people who claim they were called, but yet there is nothing in their life that backs up that call. If you can't sing, guess what? Chances are God is not calling you to be a singer. You hear what I just said? I don't care that your grandma loves how you sing. Grandma can't hear. You know what I'm saying? Here's my point. You don't have to preach a sermon or be a superstar in the church. You just have to be ready to show the same grace with people that Jesus has shown you. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. Forgive those who don't deserve it. That's what we're called to do. Our society says you should be bitter. You should be defined by your anger. You should hold on to that grudge for as long as you can. But the Bible says you should show grace. The world says you should have a chip on your shoulder. Your pastor says it better be a Dorito. So I can eat it right off of there. You know what I'm saying? The world says you should hate an entire race because you've been treated unfair. The Bible says you should show grace. This world would look radically different if we showed grace. Instead of gossiping, show grace. Instead of slandering, show grace. Instead of anger, show grace. Uh, somebody pulled me off the side at the, at the festival yesterday. They go, hey, did you see that person over there? I said, yeah. They're racist. I said, what? Yep. Hate black people. I said, but they showed up here. They must not hate us very much. Because behind my whiteness is blackness. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Whether she knows it or not, she's at a black church event. All three black people say amen. All right. Anyway. <laughs> oh, man. You know how many people message me, though, throughout the week, and, and they go, you know what, Abram, I'm not coming to your church because this person said this, or that person said that, or you said this in your sermon. Or that person goes to your church now and I don't like the way they do this or that. Or I got my feelings hurt while I was playing volleyball. Or I was doing this. Or I was doing that. You know what I'm you know me, uh, you know me all those I get all the time. I'm getting messages all the time from people that get mad at one thing or another. And I think if we just showed a little bit of grace before jumping to that conclusion, all right, could we probably come up with a solution? The answer is absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe it's not everybody else that's the problem. Maybe if, if everywhere you go there's a problem, maybe you're that problem. You ever think about that? I hate to tell people that because that breaks your hearts, you know what I'm saying? But when you give your life to Christ, that me, me, me mindset should turn into a he, he, he mindset. You know what I'm saying? He deserves my patience. He deserves my grace. He deserves my love. He deserves my time. He deserves my energy. Instead of you leaving when you don't get, get something that goes your way, maybe just maybe if you would surrender your life to Christ, you would learn to be the example to accept the call to show grace. And lastly, you would understand the grace that we're shown is not something we have earned, but it is something that God has given us. He's given us freely. Putting on a show doesn't give us grace. Attending church on a weekly basis doesn't give us grace. Memorizing the Bible doesn't give us grace. It is only by God's own merit that we're given grace. And this is my last point, guys. The grace. Here is, is the biggest phenomenon we're seeing right now in our area. Everybody wants to be healed. And everybody wants to speak in tongues. And everybody wants to have a picture-perfect moment with God. I, I have a friend, and uh, it seems like the Holy Spirit always touches him when the camera goes on. It's the most miraculous thing I've ever seen in my life. Every Sunday, the Holy Spirit touches his life right as they take a photo. I thought, man, you've been touched by the Holy Spirit more times than I have in my entire life. I can't find 
got a picture of me being touched by the Holy Spirit the way he, he touched, every Sunday he gets touched by the Holy Spirit and it's on camera. It's the craziest thing in the world. But if you cannot answer the why, if you cannot answer the why you want to be healed, the why that you want to, to have an experience, the why you want to follow God, then my question is, what's the point? At some point, we have to be able to point to His grace. It's His grace. Your marriage is healed because of Jesus and His grace. You're doing good in your life, not because you've done anything, but because of Jesus and His grace. He, it's always about Jesus and His grace. It has nothing to do with your self-righteousness or your saintly living or your God-given gift. It has everything to do with God's grace. The reason God is blessing Trinity is not because of Abram Crozier. I promise you that. All right? I, there is nothing special about Abram Crozier. I'm just loud. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I go, I, I was telling him yesterday, here's how I plan my events. What is something I would like to see <laughs> in my life? I go, I love fire trucks and helicopters <laughs> and concerts. And you guys give me money to do that kind of stuff. How's the hell? I think you're smart for doing it, but some people might question that ability. I don't know. But then, listen, there's nothing special about Abram Crozier. It is God's grace that we're being blessed. It's God's grace that we're seeing this revival. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I, I tell, this is something that I can't get into some of my colleagues' heads or even so-called Christians. Because they look at Trinity and all they see is all the sinners. And they see people who are broken or at fault. And, and maybe some of you are here this morning and look around going, I can't believe that person showed up or this person showed up. But here's the thing. I think our church is a perfect representation of God's grace. Of God's grace. If you're sitting here this morning feeling unworthy or not good enough, thank you for showing up. Thank you for showing up. Because none of us are worthy enough to be here, but because of God's grace, we're here. It's because of God's grace that everybody in here deserves a place to be here. Not because of anything they've done, but because of what God has done. God has called sinners here to this place. Not to stay the way that you are, but so that you can surrender who you are and become who He wants you to be. This is why we celebrate baptisms in this church, guys. This is why we push baptisms. So many churches never see any baptisms, and I go, because nobody ever explains what baptism is. Like, we don't talk about it. We don't celebrate it. We don't challenge people to go through it. But baptism is an outward sign of an inward decision. Jesus started out his ministry at 30 years old, and, 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 and he went and he started out with baptisms. He did a bad, he got baptized. And if Jesus did it, guess what? I think we should probably do it too. Amen. And when you go into that water, it's a reminder that God's grace covers you. The old person stays down there. The new person in Christ raises up. And I have to explain this to, to some of my Catholic friends because they get confused and they go, Hey, I was sprinkled as a baby. My parents took care of it. And here's the thing, guys. Listen, I am proud. I say all the time, good on your parents for getting sprinkled. They, they wanted to dedicate their little baby to the Lord. That's a great thing. But at some point, you have to grow up and make that decision on your own. On your own. Grace is the love that God shows to sinners such as us. It's a love we don't deserve, we can't earn. The Bible says, for by grace you're saved. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about this grace. Starting with verse 4, he said, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. Some of you guys walked in here going, Abram, I don't feel worthy enough. Abram, I don't feel good enough. Abram, I, I, here's my favorite one. Pastor, I want to get my life right before I come forward. That is not what the Bible says. If you have to get your life right before you can come to Jesus, then you're trying to earn something. It's not anything that we've done. It is God's grace alone. You're not here today by accident. God brought you here to save you. All he asks you to do is surrender your life to him. So with every head bowed, every eyes closed, we get to this time of invitation. Every head bowed, every eyes closed, begin to pray for those around you that don't know Jesus. Pray for those around you that don't.
doesn't know Jesus. Because today's the day they're going to get saved. And if you don't know Jesus, will you pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart right now. Forgive me of my sins. Watch over me. Help me surrender my life and repent of my behaviors. Start dedicating the rest of my life to you. Father God, I pray that today many will say an everlasting yes to your son Jesus Christ and be saved. God, today I just pray that the one person that walked in here broken, alone, confused, God, worried, stressed, not knowing what tomorrow's going to hold in their life, God, they came in here, God, not knowing even all the answers, God. I just pray that they don't sit there and try to get their life right before coming forward. I pray they don't sit there and, and try to make things right before coming forward, God. I pray with all my heart that today is the day they, they surrender everything. They give it all over to you. They find a place at this old-fashioned altar, God, and get saved. It's time for the men of the church to stand up. It's time for the older women of the church to stand up. And to start making a commitment today to follow you at all costs. To lead the next generation at all costs. This world has a plan to take the next generation away from you, God. I just pray that we work even harder. That we cry even more. That we pray more grace that you'll send a revival to sweep this nation, God. So we turn our hearts back to you. God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you to be their Lord and Savior, I pray that today is the day of salvation for them, God. I pray today is the day they make that commitment, God. And I pray, God, that you keep filling up our baptism waters with lost souls.